Let's pray together as we look at Romans chapter 7, verses 13 through 25. Someone told me that Fred Katana is here. There he is. Oh, okay. Is, is Gile here with us? Is Gile here as well, Fred? Okay, with Yara. Okay, well, welcome, Fred. Uh, welcome back. It's been a while. Good to see you. Um, pray God's blessings upon you and the family as, as it's growing, I'm sure. <laughs> but uh, we're very thankful that, uh, to see Fred again after uh, a year, I guess. Man, a year's time. It's hard to believe. Well, turn in your Bibles, please, to Romans 7, verses 13 through 25. I'll actually read this before we pray. We're not going to get through this whole thing uh, today. We'll have to uh, carry this over, I believe, till next week, uh, especially when we look at uh, uh, verse 25, um, or verses 24 and 25. But uh, let's read this, and uh, we'll just get started this morning. The, uh, the stark reality, even in the Christian life, Starting in verse 13 of Romans 7. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions, For I do not do what I want, but I do the very things I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil... I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members." Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so that so then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Hmm. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, as we consider this passage of Scripture, we confess that... Um, This is all too true for us, and we also confess that in many ways we fail to understand even what goes on in our own hearts. Lord, we know that we are in Christ, we know that Christ is in us, but Lord, there's this fallenness that we experience on a moment-by-moment basis that seeks to trip us up in our sin, that seeks to negate what Christ has already done for us. So, Father, we pray that through what we hear today in your word, we might be built up in our faith, made confident in the gospel of Jesus Christ, and hope in you and in the return of our Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're talking about uh, indwelling sin or sin that dwells inside the believer. And that kind of sin is kind of like a squatter that refuses to leave. You've served the eviction notice to this troublesome renter, but they just won't vacate the premises. And of course, this is becoming a real problem across our country today as, as police officers and the courts are increasingly tied up with other criminal matters property issues seem to take a back seat. So we're hearing more and more stories of squatters either invading vacant homes or renters who've stopped paying the rent, changing the locks, and refusing to leave. Sin is like that because uh, 
it's wrong, and it's a very frustrating thing, and we can feel as if there is no relief. Sin overstays its welcome if it ever did have one, and it presumes on its host to take up residence in the heart and doesn't just leave when the time is up. Such is the dilemma of the human heart, the heart of the believer in particular. And I felt this very palpably on Thursday night watching the State of the Union address I confess I got incredibly angry at what was being said. It was so, so, many, so many lies. In fact, the, I think the only truth that was told during that speech was when the president tripped up and said that Lincoln Riley was killed by illegals and even got her name wrong. So it was all I could do to, uh, to keep my composure uh, while we prayed and had the kids go to bed, and thankfully Ruth Ann had, a, had cooked a pork shoulder that she was going to turn into pulled pork, and I was there after that uh, time just mangling that pork <laughs> with the forks and the knife and trying to, to tear it up and uh, getting my frustrations out. But the fact is uh, we do live in a, a very fallen world, and there is a great deal of sin in and around us, how much more palpably do we feel that when it is in our own human heart? And uh, we, we feel tempted in many ways to lash out. And uh, sometimes we do so in very sinful ways. Paul was no different. Paul, uh, that great apostle, the human writer of this Holy Spirit-inspired book of Romans seemed to wrestle with that same sinfulness in his own human heart, even though he was very much regenerated, very much redeemed, and very much called to be an apostle to write down Scripture. So he tells us, in fact, he opens the curtain a little bit to his own human heart and gives us a little bit of a glimpse of what goes on in his heart, um, especially as uh, perhaps... Not only does he see what goes on in the world, but he, see, he sees what goes on in his own heart. Now, some conclude here that Paul is speaking of the pre-Christian life, the experience of the unsaved, the unregenerate person here. In fact, they point to phrases like uh, verse 14, I am of the flesh sold under sin. Uh, and say, well, that's not a believer, that's an unbeliever. And they point to verses like verse 17 and verse 20 where he says, it is no, lo no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. Or verse 18 where he says, for I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. And uh, some people say, well, that's not talking about a regenerate person. That's talking about the pre Christian life, and Paul is carrying over from what he said in the previous verses where he described his life before uh, becoming a believer, before being saved, and then that's simply carrying over into these verses, verse uh, 13 through 25, particularly 14 through 25. Uh, but do these statements that Paul makes in those verses, do they portray an unregenerate heart? Or do they suggest a regenerated, a regenerated heart that has been awakened to the reality of sin? And I think there are a few reasons why we can, can conclude that Paul is talking about believers in this scenario, believers who struggle with sin that continues to reside in the human heart. First of all, Paul is talking to believers. The people here, the, the original audience of this book of Romans, they are believers. In fact, in the very first chapter, he says they are called to be saints. They are called to belong to Jesus Christ. So his readers are saved people. But secondly, Paul re references himself in the present tense. Previously in uh, this chapter, verses 1 through 11 particularly, uh, 
Paul had spoken of himself in the past tense, his previous life before Christ. But now he speaks in current tense. This is what is happening now. This is what I am experiencing now. Third, Paul indeed describes a real struggle that I think every one of us has faced as believers. Think about your own Christian life and read this and you say to yourself, that is so true of me. In fact, even King David had those things happening in his own heart. David faced this very thing. We see in Rome, or excuse me, not Romans, Psalm 51 verse 3. David in that prayer of confession when he, uh, when he sinned his great sins. He said, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. David himself struggled with these things. The fourth thing is that Paul had already said that unbelievers, verse uh, 6 of chapter 7, unbelievers are apparently blissfully ignorant of this struggle. And it wasn't until the law came in and convicted Paul that he even recognized there was a problem. So this person that Paul is describing here is a person who knows the truth, a person who wants to do good, but because of sin's presence has a constant struggle in his flesh to do right. They know to do right, and they want to, to do right, but to do right is a real struggle. So if Paul is talking about believers in these verses, particularly verses 14 through 25, then what should we learn from this condition as believers in Jesus Christ? Well, I think this. Though I am freed from the bondage of sin, I am still indwelt by sin, which constantly seeks to control my body and my mind. Remember, it's not the sin that's dead in me. It is I who am dead to sin. Sin and the law are very much alive. So even though I'm freed from the bondage of sin, I'm still indwelt by that sin. And that sin constantly seeks to control my body and mind. Well, so as we look at these verses, uh, we'll see how influential sin wants to be. But in the end, we'll also see that this can be a very good reminder for us to live for God's glory. So let's take a look at it. Indwelling sin, first of all, does not condemn the law or erase the fall. The presence of sin does not negate our salvation nor does it negate the fall. Look at verse 13. Did that which is good then bring death to me? Talking about the law. By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment, right, the Ten Commandments, the law, might become sinful beyond all measure, beyond measure. Now, Paul walks very slowly, very deliberately through this teaching on sin, law, and grace. And as if he's trying to defuse a bomb, you see those TV shows where they have to defuse the bomb and they don't know if they're supposed to cut the red wire or the green wire. And it's a very tense moment. There's sweat pouring down their face. There's dramatic music. That's what Paul is experiencing here as he's teaching this, uh, this teaching on sin, law, and grace. He's, he's taking a lot of care to clear up any confusion as he goes along. So to fully untangle that confusion, he reminds us that the law is good... Because it points out my deadness, 
but it doesn't itself bring the death. The law pinpoints how dead I am, but it doesn't, it, it's not the one that kills, it's the sin that brings the death. Now, Paul doesn't condemn the law. He, he seems to be getting the notion as he's writing this that, at, that people reading this would somehow get the feeling that the law is bad. And he doesn't want to condemn the law. The law certainly is not able to save us, but as we saw last week, there are some good things in the law, particularly in pointing out our sinfulness and pointing out our dire condition before God prior to being saved. So he doesn't condemn the law. He wants to place the blame where, blame where the blame resides, and that is with the sin. So he doesn't condemn the law. He condemns the sin with the law. In other words, the presence of sin, and in some ways he personifies it because sin can't do anything, but the person that has the sin, whether it's me, my flesh, or the world, those who are walking around sinful, or the devil himself, all persons exploiting sin for our detriment. But then he takes that and somewhat personifies it as the sin. The sin which is present and seeks to destroy me doesn't make the law an accessory to the crime. On the contrary, what the law does is it amplifies the sinfulness of sin. Again, we talked about this last week. The law is that bright light that shows how dark we really are. You're not going to uh, show yourself sinful by comparing yourself to other sinners because you may look pretty good. You're only going to see your sin by comparing yourself to that which is perfect. And that is the law. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. So when the law shines on the individual, it shows the utter sinfulness of sin. So that what I may have thought was not a big deal, the law shines on it and shows it to be a major problem. Now, our tendency is to downplay sin, to make it appear nah, not as bad as, as some might think, and we have all kinds of extenuating circumstances why we might sin these sins, and it's not really a major problem. And if it weren't for this, I wouldn't have done this. But the law corrects that notion and shows us just how corrupt and evil sin inside us really is. And, of course, what Paul said earlier, don't let that sin then dominate you. You're the one who is supposed to dominate it. Now, it seems here in verse 13, Paul transitions from discussing his pre-converted life to his life after conversion because he goes in from verse 12 to verse 14 with this sort of transitional verse. And then by the time he gets to verse 14, he's now talking about himself as a converted individual. And we can see that because he moves from the past tense, uh, past tense verbs, verses 7 through 13, to present tense verbs starting in verse 14. So even though he's changed, he's regenerated, he's a new creation, he has died to sin, sin still remains. Uh, again, it's it, like an apartment building. Paul ha is somewhat like an apartment building. He has been sold to a new owner, the Lord, but sin keeps living inside him rent-free. Now, why wouldn't God just kick out the sin? Primarily because we're still fallen. And that fallenness will not be removed completely 
until we're perfectly and completely sanctified in Jesus Christ on the last day. We are new creations, but we're still fallen creatures living in a fallen world. And that may have been the same reason why God allowed Satan to enter the garden. He he still allows us to remain fallen so that he can shape us into who he wants us to be. He desires us to be disciplined and to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, indwelling sin, just because it's there, doesn't mean the law is bad. It doesn't condemn the law. Nor does indwelling sin erase the fall. We're still fallen creatures. And we see this, I think, in verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh sold under sin. See, regeneration, being new creations, doesn't mean we're no longer fallen individuals. In fact, that's what Paul seems to mean when he says that he is sold under sin, verse 14. The law being spiritual, it was brought to us by the Holy Spirit, it was breathed out by God, reminds us that we're still fallen. Now to be sold under sin is not the same thing as as selling oneself to sin. See, as, uh, this is the case with King Ahab in the Old Testament. In 1 Kings 21, verses 20 and 25, we see that King Ahab sold himself to do what is evil. That's not the same thing as being sold under sin. Why? Because to sell oneself to do evil is an active pursuit of sinfulness. It is King Ahab actively pursuing sinfulness and evil. But being sold under sin is passive. It's another way of saying that one is fallen. So a person that sells himself or herself to do evil, that is evidence that that person is not a believer, that they've never been regenerated. But a person who is sold under sin, that demonstrates nothing more than a person's fallenness. And that can be anybody. In fact, it is everybody. So Paul's lament that he is sold under sin is not that he is still enslaved to sin, but that his body particularly is still assaulted, as it were, by his sin and his fallenness. And, of course, you see that later on in Romans chapter 8 where creation kind of groans because of this fallenness. And then Paul says, we ourselves groan waiting for the redemption of our bodies. That he feels that, that that, that condition of fallenness, of having been sold in his body under sin. Now, it's not so much the presence of sin as it is the effects of the fall, bringing a kind of ignorance, verse 15, of those effects of sin that that, uh, he continues to have in his life. We don't know why we lash out. Well, it's that sin that continues to dwell in us. We don't know why we do what we do. We don't know why we just did what we did. We should know better, and yet that sin is in there continuing to try to deceive us and therefore to trip us up. It's like a man with a bad temper who gets saved. He's a new creation, but he still has a bad temper to contend with. And he has a bad temper to crucify daily his sanctification. So even as a believer, he explodes in anger And then he immediately laments that he exploded in anger. Why do I keep doing this, he says to himself. That's the kind of angst that Paul has in his mind. He knows he's saved. He knows he's in Christ, but he gets tripped up. And then why did I get tripped up again? 
because of the presence of indwelling sin. And it demonstrates that we're still fallen creatures. It doesn't excuse it. But it does show us why we continue to get tripped up over and over and over and again. Even though we can come in and enjoy wonderful worship with the Lord and with God's people and still get tripped up by sin. Because we're still fallen creatures. Well, indwelling sin secondly pits my flesh then against my mind. My flesh is against my mind. Look at verse 18. Um, <clears throat> for I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. Now he's said, said that several times actually from verses 14 beyond verse 18. But here it pinpoints Paul's wrestling with this conundrum, verses 15 through 20. He knows to do right, he wants to do right, but the sin dwelling inside him tries to take over. And he repeats this phrase in verses 17 and 20, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. This indwelling sin tries to put my mind, my spirit at odds with my body putting them at odds with one another, having a war raging inside of us. And it's, it, it, now, this war that's raging inside of us, that Paul clearly shows, is this the picture of a weak, so-called carnal Christian who lives a defeated life and whose Christian testimony is called into question? Think about it. We look at this and you might say, well, that's just those weak Christians who we don't really know if they're Christians, to be quite honest. Is that really what he's picturing? Maybe he's picturing the legalist uh, who, who tries all, all his life and tries with all his heart to live up by his own strength, live up to God's standard, but is always frustrated. Is that what this is the picture of? That's probably not. In fact, the very presence of the inner struggle suggests that this person is, at the very least, a maturing Christian who, the more he or she grows spiritually, the more intense the battle becomes. This is, after all, the Apostle Paul giving this testimony. It may not so much be the picture of a weak, perhaps even immoral Christian, and it may not be the picture of a legalist who's trying to live his life by God's standard under his own uh, abilities. It may very well be the Christian who is actually maturing in his faith or her faith, and is experiencing these struggles more and more because they're growing stronger in their faith. After all, the law shows us our sin. If we're not growing in Jesus Christ, who is the fulfillment of the law, why would we even care about the sin that's dwelling in us? John MacArthur writes this of the Christian pictured here. He says this, it seems rather that Paul is here describing the most spiritual and mature of Christians, who the more they honestly measure themselves against God's standard of righteousness, the more they realize how much they fall short. The closer we get to God, the more we see our own sin. He says, thus it is immature, fleshly, and legalistic persons who tend to live under the illusion that they are spiritual and that they measure up well by God's standard. So this may very well be the maturing Christian where sin dwelling in us tries to pit our mind against our flesh so that we war against one another. In fact, it's pride that tells us we can live up to God's standards. But it's humility that says, yet not I, but Christ through me. Jesus himself said, so you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. 
Be careful of being the kind of person that doesn't have a war going on inside of you. Because as long as you are a believer, and as long as you're living in this fallen world, and as long as you're maturing in the faith, you will have war because of that indwelling sin. See, that sin that continues to dwell in the believer tries to antagonize so that my flesh goes against my renewed mind. When Paul says in verse 18, in my flesh, what does he mean by flesh? He's not simply talking about his physical body because Jesus had a physical body but was sinless. When he uses that term here, he seems to be talking about Again, our fallenness manifest in our physical body. Paul reminds the Galatian Christians that the desires of the flesh, that same concept here, the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, Galatians 5.17. And Jesus himself warned his disciples on the eve of his crucifixion when they couldn't even stay awake for one hour while Jesus prayed. Jesus said this, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And because of the weakness of the flesh, indwelling sin can stir up real trouble by pitting our flesh against our spirit or our mind. And thirdly and lastly, indwelling sin sets up a rival law within me. That's the typo there. It's not sets us. It sets up a rival law within me. Look at verse 22. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law that, of sin that dwells in my members. Now, we're only going to touch on this today, and, and God willing, pick it up next week with these verses, but we see here another law. Uh, Verse 21, a law that I, when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. And that law stands as the antithesis of the law of God. Now we can compare this with the law of sin, as we see in verses 23 and 25, which, according to Romans 8, 2, we are free from... But even though we're freed from this law of sin, it still exerts an influence, particularly on our physical bodies, or as he says, our members, those physical parts of our body that can be used as instruments of sin, our eyes, our ears, our mouth, our hands, our feet, etc. Paul teaches the Galatians In Galatians 5.1, for freedom Christ has set us free, stand firm therefore and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. See, this rival law attacks our weaknesses. So that Paul can write in Romans 8, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth uh, until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, talking about believers, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. So that redemption of our bodies is tied with this idea that in Paul's members, in his flesh, there's that contrary law that wars against the law of God inside of us. And that war continues to go on. Now, we, we, we can't uh, continue there. We'll have to stop and pick that up again next week. But for now, we lament this reminder. What is this reminder? That though I am freed from the bondage of sin, I am still indwelt by sin, which constantly seeks to control my body and mind. Now, since indwelling sin is an ever-present reminder... How might we apprehend that and then use that in our Christian life this week not to be destroyed by that reminder, but to use that reminder to live a life that is glorifying to God? Well, first of all, it is a reminder that we're not yet 
perfected, but because we are constantly reminded of this sin that dwells inside of us, we can still exploit that reminder as a way of living righteously by faith. So let me give you four things, I think there's four, yes, four things that we can do by way of reminder. First of all, indwelling sin is a reminder to live prayerfully. It's a reminder to live prayerfully. Ephesians 5.8 tells us that we must be filled with the Holy Spirit. And that word filled is a, is a, continually, a continual filling. Be being filled with the Holy Spirit. And to be filled with the Spirit means that we drink in God's Word prayerfully so that we can be equipped with the armor of God, both outside and inside. Paul tells the Ephesians this in Ephesians chapter 6, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times, not just sometimes, but at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. So we, uh, the indwelling sin is a reminder to live prayerfully. And to live prayerfully then means to live in, in such a way that we um, are constantly being filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, being filled with the Holy Spirit also means that the Holy Spirit prays even for us when we can't pray, our for, pray for ourselves. Paul says that in Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do, know, do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. So we live our lives prayerfully. Secondly, we live our lives repentantly. We live our lives repentantly. The reality of indwelling sin should lead us to daily repentance. Should not lead us to live lives of smugness, to live lives of self-assuredness, but should live lives of repentance. In fact, moment by moment, repentance in the face of Jesus Christ. Martin Luther, in 1517, when he wrote his 95 theses and nailed them on that chapel door, that's touched off the Great Reformation. The very first thesis statement of those 95 theses was this. When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, repent, referencing Matthew 4, 17, Luther says, he willed the entire life of the believer to be one of repentance. The entire life of the believer is a life of repentance. Not just running to the priest every three years to confess your mortal sins. See, indwelling sin should remind us to live lives of humble repentance. Thirdly, indwelling sin should remind us to live resolutely, resolutely resolved that no matter what suffering we face, whether from the outside or from within, we will trust God. Paul tells us in chapter 8, verse 18 of Romans, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. We're resolved to suffer knowing that whatever we experience in life cannot possibly compare to the glory that we will experience that will be revealed to us in the last day. Even Job in the Old Testament when he was suffering terribly, he resolved that, Job 13, verse 15, though he slay me, I will hope in him. The prophet Habakkuk spent uh, those three chapters of that small prophecy in the Old Testament lamenting the fact that, that so-called so righteous Israelites were being assaulted by these unrighteous Chaldeans. How can God allow that? But then he came to this final resolution at the end of that prophecy, that resolution about the dire state of Israel, 
where he said this, though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Indwelling sin should remind us to live our lives resolutely, that no matter what happens, we're going to trust the Lord. And lastly, we, we should live prayerfully, repentantly, resolutely, last, hopefully. Hopefully. Paul says this in Romans 8, 24, for in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. We should live Hopefully, knowing that there is coming a time when even the presence of sin will be obliterated. But until then, we need patience. And thus, we hope. What hope? The hope that one day even our bodies, Romans 8, 23, even our bodies will be redeemed. But until then, we keep hoping and trusting in our Lord Jesus Christ, who is strong enough to keep us from stumbling. Amen? Let's pray together. Father in heaven, as we close up this important passage of Scripture, knowing that we haven't fully covered all that we could, we rest content in you. Lord, that sin that's still very much alive in us, very present, should not dominate us. We are not slaves to it, and yet it tries to influence us, tries to pit our bodies against our minds and our spirits, tries to convince us that we're better than we are, tries to do things that would destroy our confidence in you, tries to do things that would cause us to wander and walk away from your word. But Lord, we hold firm to Jesus who is both strong and kind. And in this we rejoice. Amen.